thank you for doing this, man. I really appreciate it. Hey, thanks for having me. Cool room you got there. Thanks. Yeah, I'm trying to geek out a little bit and uh, do I like shit it. that I was never able to do when I was younger. So, a little yeah, bit it's geek. Beautiful setup. setup. Yeah, <laughs> really well placed. It's uh, nice and symmetrical, and those those ones on the the of those comic books they're so perfectly aligned. Yeah, they're all great. That was uh, surprisingly uh, eyeball. I just was like thumbtacking. What? The That's impressive. I did use a level to make sure it wasn't. Um, yeah, I grew up in a in a uh, very not uh, clean house, so that's probably one of those things that happens to you when yeah. when you want it to be a little bit uh, different in your older age. Um, I know what you mean. I I feel the same way. I grew up in a terrifying neighborhood and scary house, and I go to my friend's house in the suburbs, and I was like in heaven. It, I went. The first time I went to, because I grew up in Flatbush, Brooklyn. Oh, yeah? Black and Hispanic uh, neighborhood, basically. Um, and my friends always laugh because up until, like, middle school, uh, some, some black kid got mad at me, and he was like, you know, something, something, white boy. And I legitimately was like, looked around, I was like, what, me? <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> that's why I actually love uh, your, your comedy just kind of knowing your, it's got to be odd too, because people know a little bit more about your background than you know about theirs when they talk to you the first time, especially if they're familiar with your stuff. But I kind of sure. connected with that, like you growing up in Treme and just like, oh yeah, like shit, man, people, uh, maybe we need a little bit more uh, like conversion therapy to start moving white people into black neighborhoods, but with no money. Yes, I have, a, I have a new bit I'm working on about that. It's so funny you say that. Awesome. Well, I will, uh, I will not say too much more because I'll let people get in on that. I'll do like one of those uh, corny intros and then we'll... Uh, okay. we'll I want to hear about uh, Brooklyn in, in the 90s also, but we can do that later. Yeah, brother. We'll, we'll definitely talk about it because I... Um, well, you know, there doesn't need to be any rhythm to it, but it's funny because I actually just saw a picture recently it was on Instagram of me in high school. So I went to William E. Grady High School, which is like a technical vocational high school in Brighton Beach. Oh, wow. Um, I studied automotive. I didn't learn anything because I had zero passion for it, but I didn't have a concept of being able to speak up and be like, hey, I'd rather do audiovisual or even like culinary arts, you know, but you would be considered like a, a bitch if you, <laughs> if you were going to. Right, right. Cook, same, you know? same here. So, um, I saw a picture recently and out of like the 10 guys in the picture, like five of them are dead, man. The shit's crazy. Yes. Yeah, dude. It's the same with me. Like a lot of my high school friends either died from drunk driving or heroin. OD. Yeah. It's just and nuts to like think about that. So it, it kind of side note, but it like pisses me off a little bit when I read a book like white fragility, I'm like, Hey, uh -huh. you probably don't know much about, uh, growing up in a multicultural area. So you just write about, uh, some, of academic. course. Yes. So uh, what, what, what is the, I've never, I'm obviously not going to read the book, but what's, <laughs> what's the gist? <laughs> like what's going on in that? Is it just, is it just guilt? It basically, the, the person who wrote it, essentially it's like, uh, if you're white, you're part of white supremacy. If you're, uh, you're, yeah, there's like nothing to do about it too. It's like, Right, if, right. If you sink, swim, or exist, you're a witch, basically. is. Wow. And, and it's a bestseller. What the hell are and we doing? Well, you know, I think people are just having a – it's such a tumultuous time with social consciousness. Uh, there's like an uprising mm -hmm. in it, which rightfully so there should be. But I think because of also a global pandemic and all this other stuff, people are grasping at things that maybe aren't the best for an overall – solution you know yes yes i think it gives them a sense of control or like since we can't do anything with the pandemic you you feel like well i can i can make this right i can change this yeah which which is a good instinct to have to sure. want to change things for the better but it's sometimes you build momentum in one direction and it becomes very difficult for people like i love your bit in out to lunch where you're like you know transition of thought it's like yo uh huh Right. I grew up a certain way, and if I only thought that way, I would not have. It would be it would be sad if like the frame of 
37 now thought the same way as the Ephraim of 27, as the Ephraim of 17. It's like that wouldn't right. be the right way to be in my mind. So, Yes, yes, completely. And, and it's funny because people call it a bit transphobic. I'm like, you're missing the whole point. <laughs> the, the, it's, it's, it's the thing that it's hard, man. Some people, I think they, they can't listen with an open ear. In my opinion, you're one of the, the best stand-up comics out in the world today. Like you, ah, jeez, come on, take it easy. Yeah, well, listen, hey, I, you know, it's it's my show. I can uh, also. I think I might be a a, a Tuesday. I don't know how quick that happens. <laughs> but I started listening to the to show with uh, you and Joe List, and I think it might have been instantaneous. Um, oh, great! Yeah, we're just. It's funny. I was talking to Chris Stefano yesterday, and we were saying how there's all these quote unquote comedy podcasts and they're so not funny. There's like, there's no jokes. And like you're calling this comedy. Where's the funny. And so me and Joe are just like, got to have a joke every two seconds. Got to be silly. Got to be wacky, goofy. Cause comedy's in a weird place. I love it, man. I think that's the, you're like, if they took, you ever read those old joke books, the truly tasteless joke books? Oh yeah. Yeah. I, well, I grew up on those. Those are in the house. All my siblings are older than me. So they're about my, my brother who's the second youngest is nine and a half years older than me. Mm. So he, they, wow. would list, they would look at the, they would read that. They would listen to like Dice Clay and Eddie Murphy and all the different, uh, you know, George Carlin, like those kind of guys. And I feel like when I listen to your comedy, it's like someone took Seinfeld and dipped him in like a, gumbo of like all the spices of those <laughs> right, right. crazy comics you know yeah I, I like his structure but i also like the ideas of louis ck or Greg geraldo or george carlin so why can't we have the what's the deal with but about jews <laughs> <laughs> you should i mean listen yeah I, they exist I, yeah, they, they're real. They're real people. Right, right. If you say their name more than once, they won't appear uh, just in front of you. Right. <laughs> right. I never got that, uh, especially not on Saturday. But I never got that whole, uh, like, hey, I'm not going to talk about this. I'm, not gonna, I'm like, why not? It, it, it's out there. It's all fodder. It's all open, open game, you know? Yeah, man. I would rather, I'd much rather open conversation with people and kind of get over that uh, general awkwardness that exists but i guess maybe that's just the way i look at it and i always hope for the best in regard to that um all right so yeah. here we go welcome to the artist dojo where we will be discussing what it means to be an artist in today's world and how one navigates that journey i'm the host a friend jambalai and today's guest in my opinion is one of the best stand-up comedians in the world today check out his special out to lunch on youtube mark normand Ah, geez, that was, I appreciate it. I feel weird. That's I, I feel bad. The audience. We had the great talk before he started rolling. And now we're. Oh no, uh, that's gonna we're... that's gonna be in there. I I, leave oh, great. I like to show the work. Okay, good. Show the work. Get in there. Yeah, because I don't want it to be like it doesn't necessarily need to be polished or anything. I think even sometimes the name of the the show seems a little weird to people because I say like the artist mm -hmm. dojo, and right. I think uh, you're not Asian, so that's offensive. I know it's super, uh, uh, well, I would say uh, culturally appropriate, but I guess it's <laughs> appropriation. Yeah, which sounds like a good thing, appropriation, you know, because it sounds appropriate. <laughs> you're like, oh, hey, thanks. You got to get my uh, kimono now. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm, I'm bowing. You can't see. <laughs> um, so with everything going on, oh, what I wanted to mention is on uh, Tuesdays with Stories, you mentioned that you had like a little alopecia spot in your beard. And yeah. I got one right on the top of my head. Really? I'm stressing out. So I think we might both be part of like the uh, existential crisis comedy club. <laughs> yeah, well, they, they, on top of the head is scary. That's dangerous stuff because you're just you're going, am I balding? But the, the beard <laughs> I feel better about because... You know, the beard never balds, so yeah. you know it's alopecia. But with yours, it could be, it could be balding. And, I mean, I'm not saying it is, but that's where my head would go. And it's I would weird. It's out. happening all, all over the top of my head. <laughs> yeah, yeah, in the horseshoe pattern, just like my dad. Oh, weird. I don't know. Blame yeah. it on alopecia. Um, right. So I guess in the, in the past, there was a, a reverence 
and a place for artists, storytellers, griots, tribal elders. Do you think that that still exists today? Uh, oh yeah, oh, definitely. I think I think they're out there. I think it's there's so much internet and so many commenters and trolls that it's there's more pushback maybe, but they're out there. They'll always be. You can't get rid of them. It's who you are. It's like trying to get rid of the gays. <laughs> hey, wait a minute. You know? <laughs> yeah, but they, they're going to be there no matter what. Yeah. And, you know, they can't reproduce and they're still there. <laughs> so, Man. good for them. I'm not, I'm not saying I want them to go away. I'm just saying, like, they're very uh, uh, resilient. They've been, they've been around, man, since the beginning of time. Yeah. From what I heard. I know. that They're literally a dying breed, and they're still there. It's pretty impressive. So do you, uh, do you see yourself as, as an artist, craftsman, both, neither, something else altogether? Well, you know, comedy is it's the least pretentious art form, which I love. Even calling it an art form for most comic makes us, our assholes tingle a little bit in a bad way. Uh, so we don't like to call ourselves artists because it sounds too douchey. Um, but I think it is an art form if you really if you really work on it because it's got to be it's got to be relatable. It's got to be hilarious. It's got to be un, uh, clear and understandable. It's got to be accessible. So that's the hard part. Everybody goes, "Hey, he's a funny guy," but Bill Burr is not just a funny guy. He's also a construct uh, uh, like a what is structure. You got to structure the bit. You got to say it the right way. You got to time it right. So that's really what stand-up is. Everybody thinks it's just being funny, but it's actually the packaging of the words that's really the art form. Well, I look, I, um, so I'm an actor as well, and when I do it, even sometimes when I say it, I'm like, ugh, because, you know, you end up yeah. getting lumped in with, like, like, like if you say you're a comedian and then you somehow get lumped in with, like, half the people that have Netflix specials, in my head, yeah. that doesn't compute to me. I agree. I, everyone's got comedian in their Twitter bio, and I'm like, you did comedy once, you bombed horribly, uh, everybody hates you, and now you just yell at people about comedy. You're not a comedian. Yeah, so then when I think of like people who, like some who you've mentioned, like Bill Burr or, or Chris Rock, those, the, how many times they've, they've ran a, a bit or uh, an hour of work at, in order to really tighten it up to then put it out there, it's kind of the same thing. And at least for me in regard to acting where my hope is that the work I do is received as art that the, hopefully there's enough craft within it that at some point it's like, Oh, I've, I've hit a point where this might've reached artistry, but that, that also makes me tighten up. Like you said, you know, <laughs> I'm like, Ugh. yeah, but I don't totally. want to dismiss it. Cause I think I've dismissed it for such a long time where I'm like, Oh, you can't call this art, but then you, you see it and it exists. And there are people who, when they're doing it at the highest level, you're like, oh, shit, that's art. Yeah. Well, stand-up is so cool because how many shows are there of, like, inside the actor's studio with the fucking classical music coming and the guy with the beard and the suit and he's got a stack of questions and, and they're like, I had to find my motivation and uh, my emotions. And it's like, shut the fuck up. You pretended to be JFK for 20 minutes. Nobody gives a fuck. You put a wig on, you put a suit on, like somebody put makeup on you. They said, cut. Then they took the best version of the 17 takes you took. I mean, anybody can do that. I'm, I'm, look, Daniel Day-Lewis, Meryl Streep, Denzel or whatever. I get it. They're, they're talented, but like, let, let's not start blowing Zac Efron. Like he's some kind of artist here. Like, Comics had to do it alone. They will write it. They had to perform it in fucking basements over and over while somebody's drunk or you know getting a BJ or whatever the hell, and then perfect it and then put it out. And even in your special, they could be fuck ups. They could be flubs. They could be a heckle. So like, oh, yeah, man. How do you deal with like? That's why I kind of uh, I started in theater first. So that's why I appreciate that more, in the sense because an audience is not going to lie to you. If you're not yes. doing your yes. thing. Yes, theater you know, I respect more, for sure. They'll give you that energy. But, like, with heckles, man, that's got to be so That's got to be so nuts. I mean, it's, when you let go, because I grew up in a roast culture. In Brooklyn, everybody roasted yeah. each other. That was just yeah. how you did it. You, you love somebody, you joke with them, you made fun of their mother, you made fun of them, you, you know, oh, your sneakers look like shit, you, you know, but <laughs> no matter what, it was like... It was love, you know? 
Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think that's a healthy way to grow up. I think it kind of builds a builds character, builds a tougher skin, builds some personality, and uh, it builds you. It just lets you know what the real world is like. This is how people think. They go negative, and if we can turn that negative into kind of a lovey thing, like I only trash the ones I love, then I think that's beautiful. And uh, it's crazy how people are so sensitive now that. You can't bust anybody's balls anymore, even though that is a, a way to say, hey, I'm, I, I'm a fan. I like you. Yeah, I, I, um, I've had a conversation with, uh, with my martial arts instructor about some of this stuff. And we're like, the term actually in my head more is like people are being fragile. Because to be really sensitive, like, for example, if you're on stage and you notice something different and it has an effect on the, th the thing that you're telling, the joke that you're telling, and out of that comes like, you're like, oh, that's the button to the bit or whatever. You yeah. Have to be sensitive to that moment. Ah. Whereas if someone, you know, you roast them jokingly and they take it personal, that's more of a fragility than a sensitivity, in my opinion. Oh, I like that. White fragility. I think you're, <laughs> I think you're on to something. <laughs> I think that's a great point. I like that because sensitivity doesn't have to be like weak. It doesn't mean I'm crying. I'm sensitive. It actually just means, you know, you feel more and you're, you're perceiving all these things at once. But fragility is, yeah, that means you're easily crumbling. So I think, I think you nailed it there, Fatty. That's a great call. Thanks. Yeah, I've been trying to put weight on. It's tough. Uh -huh. You, you got a, a, a Jorge Masvidal kind of vibe going over there. Yeah, well, much, much less of the uh, just randomly punch people in the face if give them a three piece of biscuit if they say something to me. <laughs> right, right. I try yeah, to be yeah. like, hey, man, you know, let's chill. It's all peace. I hear you. I hear. Well, are you in Brooklyn now? No, I'm actually. I'm in. I'm in Buffalo. I had. I left out the. Uh, I left away from the the craziness. Uh, yeah. Of the global pandemic, my fiance has like a. Um, autoimmune disorder so and since mm -hmm. she's originally from buffalo we're like hey let's just get a place up here and not be in the craziness for smart a bit, so i get it i mean sucks you're in buffalo but i get it <laughs> yeah i mean it's nice right now but the winter is gonna be i'm gonna turn into jack nicholson oh. and shining and just kill everybody yeah yeah so wait how old are you uh 37 oh nice we're the same age. i'm 36 so yeah, we're both a couple of 90s douches. Yeah, I mean, it's funny because I coming up in the 90s, my, my siblings were older, so I, I gravitated towards a lot of the things that they liked. So then I liked yeah. things that were like from the 80s, but then I had like, you know, one hand in analog, one hand in digital, and it just felt like such a different, like we're this odd little mid-space mid, mid -space generation, I think, that... uh might remember the world a way that younger generations won't, you know? Definitely. And I'm, I'm so thankful that I grew up, I guess, half my life without internet or social media. I mean, I'm so grateful that we were kids who could just run around. Like no one had a video camera on them. No one had a phone on them. No one had a GPS or Uber or whatever the fuck. And you just jumped. I mean, you played some video game. You played Super Nintendo every now and then, but, you know, you were you were outside, you were running around and just living your life freely and you weren't like inundated with news and comments and likes and retweet, all that shit. It's I remember that sucks my, for kids I, now. It was a little different because I remember very early on there was a lot of like freedom. Then my dad passed away when I was five. So then my mom uh. was just scared as shit to like let me out because it was constantly right. like, it was just a bad neighborhood. So I would right. be like playing video games and reading comics and stuff like that. So that helped me a little bit through that time. But right in like my teenage years, right prior to going to college, that's when I got my, I started getting my fill of like, Oh, I'm going out, I'm going doing stuff. And, and that was still yeah. like right in that crux of time. So. All right. Yeah. Well, that's, that's good too. Cause also, I, I feel like if my kid's into comic books and that shit, I don't have a kid, but if, he, if I did, he, I would love that because it's all art. It's all escaping. It's all creativity, and you're just consuming all this cool you know, ideas and illustrations, and, and you're reading still. I think that's all good. Well, ideas that people are trying to push today were being like explored in comics and other things in the early 90s. Like There were oh, really? superheroes with disabilities and... 
Oh. There were trans characters in video games, like right. You know, stuff that now it is getting kind of smashed in people's face. Then it was part of a story. It was just like, hey, this. That's a good what, point. You know? Yeah, a lot of anti-bullying. I remember like Stan Lee, Brooklyn Jew. He was all about, you know, diversity and not having racism and all that shit back in the day. Your um I love the story of uh your nanny. <laughs> oh yeah, Enos. Yeah. What's is that I, I think I read that you were trying to have that become something, like a show or something like that. I've been pitching this show for the last eight years, just trying to get some traction on it. Everybody's like, I get emails three times a day. How is that Enos thing not a show? What are you doing wrong? You got to pitch it this way. You got to make it animated. You got to do this. And I'm like, I've tried, man. I got no juice. It, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a honky. <laughs> I got, I'm, not, I'm not famous. I'm trying. But I had, well, you're, animated. You're, I had you're some special. kid draw it. Your special is like close to two and a half million at this point on YouTube. Yeah, so we're getting there. It's it's blowing up, man. I'm hoping that people, you know, see you in the uh, in the creative light that they should because you're clearly putting in the work. And I appreciate it. Yeah, that that was a big wake up call. I got a lot of a lot of rejections on that. Then I put it out and it popped. It did really well, and it, now I'm getting like the hey, we'd love to work with you. We'd love to be in the Mark Norman business. I'm like. Fucking come guzzling douche. Where the hell were you a month ago when I when I needed you, you know? But they, they're scared. They don't want to take a chance on nobody. And I was ready to drown my sorrows. Uh, for yeah. Time, you know? I know. I was I was crushed that nobody would buy it. I put my jizz, anal, and queef into that thing, and uh, nobody That's gave a fuck. <laughs> yeah. And then it did well, and they're like, hey, how are you, buddy? We, we, we never talk anymore. I'm like, I've been here the whole time, you kook. Yeah, it's rough, man. It's like... Yeah, I see that too sometimes, and I just decided I wanted to kind of create my own thing. Because while I'm waiting to go audition for like bigger films or different projects and stuff, and I know what I'm capable of, but it's like I can't wait on other people to to make that happen. You just got to put stuff out, and I think you're the perfect example of that. Like, you, I watched your special once, laughed my ass off, and then I told my fiance, I was like, as an excuse to watch it again, I was like, hey, let's have a let's have a date night. Let's. Get <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks. I, I feel bad for her, but I appreciate it. Yeah, she fell asleep towards the end, but only because she was right. tired, not because uh, it wasn't good. <laughs> I'll take it. She got further in than my parents. Yeah. Oh, no. Um, so I guess we kind of covered it, but what does it mean to be an artist in today's world for you? Well, here's the weird thing is everybody goes, oh, my God, with Trump and with uh, the, the racism and BLM and Bernie and all this shit, like Biden, there's so much to talk about. There's so much material. I'm like, I don't give a shit about any of that. I care about people and, and what the like, human interest and society. I, I could care less about Trump, plus everyone else has talked about Trump. Like, we all know he's a wacko. So I don't want to cover it. It's too on the nose. I like finding the little weird hidden subtle things and, and exposing that They're kind of like how Seinfeld will talk about the hair on the wall in the shower. I want to do that, but you know, more about people or, or little things in, in society. And uh, so I think being an artist today is it's cool in the way that you can put your own shit out there. That's amazing. And they there used to be these gatekeepers. There's probably brilliant comedians, brilliant artists, brilliant writers, who never got a chance before because there was no YouTube or there was no self publishing or, or, you know, social media to just put your shit out. So in that way, it's great. But now we're, I feel like we're more worried about, especially the industry, they're more worried about diversity and, and like perception. We need to per be perceived as open-minded and, and different and, and inclusive. And you're like, yeah, yeah, but it, it still should be good art. Like it's weird to just put a guy up cause he's black when there's so many funny black artists, you know, like you're doing a disservice to black people by just putting up a guy cause he's black. Yeah. When there's so many funny the black people. It's, it's yes. the illusion of diversity versus actual diverse thought and action. Right. Right. And look, don't get me wrong. I've gone to a lot of shows where there's nine black guys on the bill who all look and sound like Hannibal. And they're like, look how diverse. I'm like, this is the opposite of diverse. <laughs> they all look the same. They sound the same. And they're all just a skinny black guy. Like, this is not diverse at all. You, you, you don't even know the definition. So, 
it, it's a weird time, and I think everybody's overcorrecting and the pendulum swinging up my ass and all that shit. But uh, yeah, I think uh, it funny should win. I mean, look at a bas a baseball team or a basketball team. We got these seven foot two black guys on the team, not because they're black, because they're the best players, and everybody's okay with that. I'd like everything to be that way. Yeah, I think we'd be the shortest people on the team. Oh, for sure. Yeah, I mean, we wouldn't even get picked. <laughs> we'd be the towel guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, was and, there? A... I don't know. I grew. Is it that weird? I grew up watching uh, Ellen and Carol Burnett and Madeline Kahn and Dave Chappelle and Chris Rock and Richard Pryor and Eddie Murphy, like Bill Cosby, whoever the hell. That's a weird one, but. I don't know. I was never like, I love this black guy. I was just like, oh, I love Chris Rock. He's fucking no, hilarious. I, I felt this when I grew when I was growing up, I watched martial arts movies all the time. Same. And I would watch Bruce Lee. And Bruce mm -hmm. Lee was like, at the time and even now, it's still like this altruistic badass hero. And I yes. never looked at him once and said, Oh, I like the Chinese guy. Yeah, of course. Of course. And I was like, he's awesome. Like, Bruce Lee is yeah. awesome, you know? And I think it doesn't take away if you identify with something. Like, you know, my family's Albanian. I grew up in Brooklyn. I'm Muslim. I could say all the things that, you know, per perception-wise make me unique. But I I'm not going to also, like, not look at something else and dismiss it or point it out extra because, I don't know, it's, it's odd to me. Yeah, I agree. And look, don't get me wrong there's been a lot of shit in the past of like, don't put this guy on, he's Muslim, or don't put this guy on, he's brown, who's going to relate to that? And then you always have these these people who grow up later, like brown people grow up later and go, there was no one on TV who looked like me, and blah, 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 which sucks. So I, I am aware that exists. But the beauty of it is now, if you're a brown guy or gal, and you're talented, just put it out yourself and let the public decide. And that's what we can do now that we couldn't do before. So that's or, huge. Or even if it's just a feeling of expression, like, like I'm doing this, you know, I don't suspect that it's going to be, I, I just want to be able to have these types of conversations with people. I don't think it's going to be the next anything. And I personally don't care if it is. I, I just want, if anyone's looking for like a conversation about art or what it is to be an artist or like my 17, 18 year old self trying to like, you know, growing up in a family that's a uh, blue collar, like Albanian superintendent. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They had no concept of like art. They're like engineer. <laughs> right, right. Yes. So maybe if the conversation helps, you know, someone along that path, then that's kind of my, my positive, putting my positivity out there a little bit. I completely agree. Totally. Yeah. Um, but was there a, a specific moment you realized that, this or comedy is what you wanted to do with your life and could you share what that moment was uh sure i mean i was such a you know i'm from louisiana i'm a nobody i'm such a shitty weird upbringing and then i had low self-esteem and all that shit so i was rudderless i failed at everything i tried maybe i'll do this job maybe i'll do that job i failed at everything i was a big labor guy i was a furniture mover i was a janitor i was a bus boy and uh, so I was like, what am I going to do? Am I going to be a UPS guy? Am I going to be a hotel bellhop? Like, that was where my head was at. And my dad kind of pulled me to the side angrily and was like, you want to be a bellhop? What are you doing? You, I wish I was your age. You got your whole life ahead of you. You can do anything you want. You're going to pick bellhop? And I'm like, well, I got no skills. And he was kind of like, just try some shit. You used to be in theater as a kid. You like theater. And I'm like, yeah, but I'm not going to be an actor. I don't even like acting. And he's like, well, I feel like you have expression like you have something you want to get out there but i don't know what it is and comedy i always loved but i always looked at it like being an astronaut like well what am i steve martin what am i bill cosby am i seinfeld that's insanity that's a whole nother light year away i don't know those people and but i just said fuck it i'll try an open mic i got nothing else going on and i tried it it went horribly but it was so fun and i had a blast and I got hooked, and the next day I'm looking through the news or the the yellow pages for comedy clubs and all this, and I just started getting into that world, and it was something to do. Because when you're like a young boy, you know, 19, 20, 21, 
you need something to do or else you'll just light a fire in the street while drinking a 40 and looking at a porno mag, you know? You just get a black trench coat if you don't do anything. Yeah, yeah exactly. You get a chain wallet, some fingerless gloves, <laughs> and, a, and, a, and a Mountain Dew and some weed and you got a knife. But I just needed something to do. I needed a group. I needed a hobby. I needed a hang, a crew. And I had all my drinking buddies, but, you know, I was puking every night and fucking fat chicks and doing random pills. So I tried this open mic and I was hooked. And then I had a buddy, you know, you start hanging out with all the comics. These are your new friends and you have common interests and you, you have a new bit to work towards. You got a new five minutes. Oh, that's joke bomb. Let me retool it and tweak it. And now you're, now you're off and running on, on a new project. And you have something to look forward to. We got that show tonight. It's a three-hour drive. I can't wait. We'll get a couple beers and drive up and see what happens. And hopefully we do well. And it was just, it, it made life worth living. And then they said, I'm moving to New York. And I said, I'm going with you. Now that's a whole new adventure in your life. Now you got to live in Brooklyn. We got mugged. We got bed bugs. We got the whole <laughs> thing. And uh, oh, Welcome. Welcome to Brooklyn. Yeah, yeah exactly. Crown Heights, baby. Oh, yeah. And, and then, and then now, oh, oh I'm doing a, a, a real comedy club. Oh, my God, they gave me $20 to do a set. I told jokes. I got money for it. What the fuck? Now I'm never leaving. And then you meet Schumer. You meet Louie. You meet this. You meet that. You're doing clubs. You're on the road. Oh, my God, they give me a free meal in Chicago. I'm sleeping on a couch, but who gives a shit? And You're like, wait, wait, wait. Then, on, on top of the free meal, on top of the $20, you start freaking out? Exactly. I'm freaking out. Then you get a free beer and drink tickets. I mean, the whole thing was bananas. And then before you know it, like, hey, you built this set. Now you have a manager and now you're on YouTube. And now, oh, my God, Conan O'Brien is willing to, to he's accepting five minute submissions. Let me try it. Oh, my God, I got it. You know, like, and, and it's these little stepping stones over a decade, really. And, uh, yeah, that's it. That's life. And there's no rhyme or reason. There's no blueprint. It's, it's a huge risk. 99% of people fail. Uh, but what else, was, what else was I doing? So fuck it. And I had a great time. And now comedy's over. <laughs> now comedy, yeah, you, like, you, you grew into it. They're like, sorry, Mark. Uh, it's all over. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I finally got some butts and seats. I'm on Rogan. I'm on the Tonight Show. I got a special on YouTube that's doing well. And hey, the whole thing's fucked. Yeah, the simulation was like, wait, Mark, Mark's doing well. Uh, throw in that global pandemic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like I got promoted. I, I married the woman of my dreams. And then we had a miscarriage. Oh. <laughs> I, saw, I always go too, too harsh. No, that would, uh, that probably accurately depicts the pain of, uh, all right, I'm cutting that out. <laughs> no, <laughs> leave it in, leave out. it in. We have no, I'm, le I'm leaving there. it all in. I, I love actually, one of my favorite things you do in, in stand-up is like you fill those moments of like, I, whether it's awkward silence or like awkward laughter or whatever it is, like you'll just say things in between it. And for me, that makes it even 10 times funnier because you're acknowledging the thing that's happening in the moment. Oh, yeah. Like, basically, like, whether it's comedy, you just say, like, comedy or, you know, whatever, like, in between it, that shit makes me laugh so hard because I love those moments in life, especially when I see it happening between two people. Right, right. Mm -hmm. I, that, that, anyway, side note, that just cracks me up. Oh, um, thanks. Uh, that's just me being a little nervous and feeling that awkwardness and having to address it. So I appreciate it. A lot of A lot of good comics are, like, too cool for school, and they're like, I can sit in this silence. I'm the man. Fuck you. But I'm like, I'm not the man. I, I'm not <laughs> feeling confident right now at all. So I got to go comedy. Oh boy. Here we go. You know, I'm, <laughs> I'm nervous. But that to me, that's the real, that's the actual moment. Right. Right. I get like, it. There's, yeah. there's a time for, you know, whatever. There's a time for stoicism and all this other shit. But when you're, Oh, here's another thing I actually wanted. This reminded me of. So the idea of like comedy and like in, and martial arts training. So, when I train, I'll go in, my training partner's there, we bow as a sign of respect. And we'll say like, hey, um, you know, in this, let's say sparring session, if something happens, if you happen to kick me in the face, I'm not gonna take it personal because we bowed before we started. We both have a concept of what this is. Yes. So I feel like there should be a, a, an element of that in like, in comedy places, like in, uh, 
if you're at the the comedy cellar, for example, like when people walk in, they have to like touch a sign as like a, a an idea of like, oh hey, mutual respect, like whatever, <laughs> yes. whatever you hear here, different ideas, like you you actually can't get offended because it's not the intention of the uh, the comic. They're just actually trying to make people laugh. So right. If you feel like you've gotten you know proverbially kicked in the face. Uh, you know, it's no, it's no place for you to get offended or heckle or anything like that. I love that. I've always said that. Uh, I mean, comics have been talking about this for 50 years, but like, if you're offended, that's okay. I mean, look, I was a young white kid in the black neighborhood. The amount of white boy jokes I heard when I was a kid were horrific and they hurt my feelings, but who cares? If my feelings were hurt, you, you move on. Like, I don't think they wanted to kill me. Uh, so also if you're getting beat up pretty regularly, you're not worried about a, a, a honky cracker joke, you know? Yeah, yeah. So, so also, it kind of just shows like, how words, privileged is your life. You're like, words actually don't hurt. <laughs> right, right. Compared to that, no way. Yeah, so, compared to a full-on beating. Well, uh, my thing is, I like, I watch MMA, and I don't, you know, I'm not an expert, but I enjoy it. And I always think, like, Shane Gillis, you've heard of this guy, he got in trouble with SNL for saying gook or something yes, like, or yes, just shink yes, or one of yes, those. Yes, so. Yes. So my thing is, he was on a comedy podcast trying to be funny. Whether you thought he was funny or not, this is his intention. Uh, he was doing a character, whatever. You, you, you were offended, okay. But it's almost like a UFC ring. If, if I hit a guy on the sidewalk, I go to jail. That's assault. That's physical abuse, whatever. But if I'm in that ring, that, I'm allowed to hit the guy, and he's allowed to hit me. And that's what we've all signed up for. So if you're on this comedy podcast and you get upset, it's too bad you're you're in the ring. Yeah, there's like a mu there's a mutual agreement as to what's happening. Right, right, exactly. But I didn't think it was funny. Yeah, but somebody else did. It doesn't. You're not you're not the be all, end all. You know, if you don't like Tabasco, oh, oh. Do we have to get rid of hot sauce. <laughs> I can't take the heat. Yeah, uh, exactly. I, I it it actually prevents people from swinging for the fences, so to speak. Yes, like you yes. You feel very tentative in life because you can't have like a really honest, even f let's say it's a failed expression because that happens too. Sometimes you say something, you miss the mark. You're like, ooh, I messed up. <laughs> right. But I think that should be allowed, especially in, in to tie it in, if, if you're trying to do something that's going to be, if you're trying to go from Mount Rushmore level comedy or actor or whatever you're doing, like you're really trying to be one of the best ever or even just do it because you love it, you, you got to be able to swing and totally miss. Yes, everybody yes. Without and being ridiculed for it. Yeah, if you cut somebody off when they attempt a big swing, they'll never get that home run because you keep chopping their legs off when they're, when they're working on it, you know? So, like, it, it's almost like when I see these pictures from the 30s and you see some – police officer measuring a woman's thigh and he's like you're showing too much leg on the beach you're going to jail and you're like what are we doing here what the what, what kind of world are we living in so when i hear some lady like that was offensive you should be fired from your job at comedy central i'm like you just look like the cop who's measuring the knee like what i, I know in your head you think you're doing the lord's work and saving the world but like you're bringing us back sister this guy's trying to put out some art he's trying to make somebody laugh and you don't like it, so you have to come in and regulate and shake your fist. It's very strange to me. It's like, go hug your kids, get a hobby, create something, build a, a dresser, yeah, I think, something. I think that's, that's, there's something to be said for that, man. Create something, you know, instead yeah. of chopping, chopping the legs out from other people, let's have, let's have ideas kind of compete with each other a little bit. You know, yes, and yes. Not, in, not in like this academic way where people are they're trying to win the argument. It's like if we're talking about a subject and you present an idea, I present an idea, it should be with the goal in mind to be like, hey, what's the better outcome or the more diverse thought process versus just, oh, I don't like when, when you made fun of when you said midget in your comedy special. It's like right. you know, you're making a point, you know? Yeah, I know. And we're all, I thought we were all adults here. And, I, and it just, it's like such a uh, paint-by-number Pavlovian response. Like, wait a minute. You said midget. Midget is bad. Kill this guy. And you're like, I know, but you got to, there's nuance here. You got to think about it. I'm a comedian. I'm on stage. I'm making a point. I'm making a joke. 
like I know you heard midgets, so your your alarms are going off, but put some thought into it, weirdo. Like I, I, I don't know. It's just the whole thing's crazy. And here's what scares me the most. I get it. People are allowed to be offended. Some people go far. Look, every white guy on stage shouldn't be saying the N-word every 10 seconds. Like, of course, that, it, that, that can be gratuitous bullshit. But when a comic is sitting down to write and he or she goes, oh, I got a fun idea. Uh, you know what? That'll get me in trouble. Scratch it. Scratch it. You're like, that's when I get nervous. Because now, now you're in our head and now you're stopping ideas from happening out of fear. And that's when it gets serious. I love, um, who, shit, I'm drawing a blank right now. I'm sorry. Um, the person you, because you have like little sessions on your, have been on your YouTube channel where you, you run ideas back and forth with other comedians like Sam Morell. Right. Um, and I love that. I think that's like, I don't know, like a little jam session, writing session. You bring your idea to the table. And even if, there isn't something fully there. Like, you know, the people that you can make the idea percolate with. Yes. Yes, exactly. So do you find yourself hanging out with a lot of, uh, those types of comedians that you feel you can gel with and, and run those ideas by them? Oh, dude. I mean, that's 95% of my, my friend base is, is other comics. And I get two texts a day or three texts a week. Just, what do you think about this? Is there anything here? Does this have legs? And then I write back, I like it. I would change this. And then I say, well, since you threw one, let me throw one at you. And then I throw a premise out there and I'm on Twitter all day, like throwing a joke out. Then I'll get some, some feedback or not. Then I'll change it. You know, it's all about uh, reaction and working it out and tweaking it. So yeah, I mean, that's all I hang out with is comics is comics immediately have 50,000 things in common. We've all bombed. We've all killed. We've all held a microphone. We've all done the row. We've all been on stage. We've all, you know, uh, been heckled. Like you immediately have, so, it's almost like you're soldiers in, in boot camp. Do, uh, do people, I have a chat with my friends and it's the most ridiculous chat. We just throw like ideas out there. It, it's, there's like, uh, you know, cinematographers, writers, uh, that have worked on TV shows and all types of stuff. And we just throw stuff back and forth, but we don't ever, get to a place where like, Hey, that's, that was my idea originally kind of a thing. Do you find that? Mm -hmm. I know there's, there's instances of that in comedy where people either joke steal or whatever. So when you're collaborating with somebody, what's the, the person who brings the idea to the table kind of their thing? Yeah, that's a great question. Cause that comes up a lot. It's like, actually that's kind of similar to my idea uh, that I told you last week. And it feels like you just kind of took that and changed it a little bit. And, and then some people are, like some people give you a great great note on your premise and then they're like oh that note was actually a big thing i could do now i should i shouldn't give you that note and then you're like yeah but you wouldn't have thought of that note if i hadn't presented this bit to you and they're like i know but i can do something with it so then there's a lot of that shit where it's just whose property is it and that that has caused some real feuds between a lot of comics it happens quite a bit you kind of almost have to be very diplomatic about it you got to be like you're right that was yours first, even though I really want it, but I get it. So, and plus jokes are so hard to come by that you tend to really fight for your material. Yeah. I can imagine, especially if it's like a, a interesting premise or a totally different take on something. Yeah, exactly. Um, and you know, that take could make you famous. That could go viral. That could be on Conan. That could be on Netflix. So definitely, definitely people really get sharp elbows around their bits. How do you um how do you navigate being an artist in your personal life and in today's world? I mean, we kind of covered it, but like maybe what um what are some of the things you do to uh just keep going, I guess? Like what what motivates you to keep going to continue walking the path you're on? I think for me it's I'm like, you know, 80% artist, 20% civilian. So, I've really let the the comedy world dictate my life way more because it's it's my favorite thing it's all i've got it's the only thing i'm good at it's it pays my rent so you know the girlfriend suffers the family suffers the non-comedy friends suffer so that that's a bummer but i don't know i just love comedy so much and uh you know you look at like a michael jordan i watched that documentary the other day on espn and he's just like in the in the uh the what do you call it the court he's playing on the court all day in practice 
Then he's like getting a massage. Then he's watching game film. Then he plays the game. Then he talks to the press. I mean, it's all basketball. And I, he mentions his wife once. I didn't even know he had a wife. I didn't know he had kids. I never saw him the whole time. And I related to that so much. I'm like, I'm in a green room. I'm on the road going to a gig. I'm at the gig. I'm at a bar after the gig discussing the gig. Then I'm in the hotel room writing a new bit. You know, it's just all comedy. I think also the people who, who surround you, or at least me, because, the, listen, man, I could have worked a corporate job, you know, 15, 20 years ago and been the president of some BS company now and been financially mm -hmm. set and all this other stuff, but I would be absolutely miserable. So oh, yeah. I oh, yeah. That everyone that surrounds me, at least the ones who understand me, know that, like, hey, this is just what I got to do, man. Out of the nearly 8 billion plus people on this planet, statistically, I, I, everyone can't fit in the same thing, you know? Here, here. Well said. I, I, they always say life's too short. I don't think life is short. I think life is long, but I do think it goes by quickly. So I think go with your gut. If you want to bail out and do your own thing and not work at some CEO bullshit, I think good for you. And look, here's the problem. Everybody goes, I got a decent job, but I hate it. I hate my cubicle. I hate the fluorescent lights. I hate my boss. I'm thinking about just jumping ship and starting some venture. And I'm like, do it, but you got to do it. You got to go all the way. They think, oh, I'll get out. I'll be some artist. I'll get laid. I'll have a studio and I'll grow a mustache and I'll start painting. You got to do it though. You're going to struggle for 10 years. That's the other thing. People go, must be so nice being a comic. I'm like, oh, it's fucking amazing. But give up a decade of your life to eat ramen noodles and bomb in front of nerds for uh, 10 years and do the road and ride on a, a bolt bus. Like do all that shit too. Don't just act like I got here yesterday. Yeah. I mean, you know, people, that's why jokingly I said earlier, like I like to show the work because people see the end product and yeah, could I edit the conversation and really polish it and make it seem like something different than what it was? Yeah. But then that is actually kind of a falsehood. Yes. Because that's what happens all the time. Like someone's going to look at your career or, or someone else's career and be like, oh, must be nice. And then fill in the blank. It's like, no, not must be nice. It feels good because I love it. But right. I had blood, sweat and tears spilled for this thing that I love to do. But no one's going to see that because it's not necessarily for them to see. You know. Great point. Boy, you, you really got a good head on your shoulders. You can really uh, put things together nicely, like a nice little summation well thanks man this is actually the time frame where i was going to ask for a donation to the uh for the <laughs> foundation there you go get <laughs> on it folks venmo um so how do you deal with failures mistakes regrets on this path Whew, i am not good with i've failed so many times i've got so many regrets i'm not good with that shit i, I had a bad podcast appearance the other day just, you know, bullshit podcast with a couple of guys who were all being funny and, and shitting on each other. And I, I just couldn't get anything out. And I couldn't get my brain in the right place. And I was bombing all day long. And I got off that pod and I just had to walk around the neighborhood for like an hour. I was like, God, that sucked. You suck, you fucking bitch. God, you got to get better. You got to, you know, and just punching myself in the head and hanging my head down and walking around. People probably thought I got divorced. I was so sad. And, uh, I, that's just, I think you need those though. Cause I was like, I was not going to let that happen again. I was so hurt by it that it motivated me to, uh, step it up. And, and as much as that pain hurts and you want to avoid it, I think you need it. How do you celebrate victories, accomplishments, good ideas, things that come up? Oh man, when you get that good idea, it's, it's very rare, but when that just joke just hits you and, ah, it's the best feeling in the world. I just celebrate in my own head. I don't, I don't really go out and drink. I mean, I drink anyway, so like, I don't really do that. I just, I just kind of have a little party in my own body. Like, oh my God, this is great. It's, and no one else is going to get it. You know, you can tell another comic, they go, oh, yeah, good for you. Or you tell your girlfriend, she doesn't get it. So I just, it's, it's internal. I just really love it. And, so much can come out of a good new bit or a good new idea and uh it can feed you it can get you money it can get you praise it can get you exposure so like to me a brand new idea or a new bit that's killing and it has a, it's like a great original big bit like that trans bit with the midget 
that bit took six months to get right. And like a week before I recorded, I came up with that Kevin Hart line at the end. Like, well, I, I respect Kevin Hart because he's also a midget. And yeah, that, that just was... tied the whole thing up. And you're like, oh, my God, thank God I got that in. So good. So like, ah, oh, thanks. So that, but that, that was, it's like you said, that was months of bombing that bit because I couldn't really figure out the placement and my feet weren't on under me and all that. And, and you got to let people work it out. Do you have any uh, daily habits or rituals? And if so, what are they? Oh, man, this is embarrassing. I mean, I'm pretty OCD. And uh, with the gyms closed, I do a bunch of push-ups a day. I do a bunch of squats a day. I, uh, I go to the scaffolding around Manhattan, and I do pull-ups like a fucking dork. And uh, I tweet no, a couple times a day. I got to get a few jokes. If you were hanging out with a bunch of black dudes in the 90s, you'd be the man. <laughs> yeah, those guys. That was always cool. like, oh, that dude's tough. Right, right. Yeah, you never mess with the pull-up guy. That guy meant business. Um, but yeah, so I, I got a lot of shit like that. Then I have to tweet some jokes every day, or I go crazy, and uh, I try to do a, like at least a podcast a day. I have a million podcasts just out there on the internet that three people have heard. What do you do when? What do you do when people like? Because you tweet out some really great jokes, but then I'll see like a meme like a day or two later, like someone else goes, mm -hmm. like, that's Mark Norman's joke, man. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. It's fucking those memes, man. These memes are brilliant. There's some amazing memes, but they just take all, they'll just take anything. They don't give a shit. So that, that has really hurt comedy, like the fat Jew and fuck Jerry, all those cunts. Oh, yeah. Um, but what, what can you do? I mean, also saying on a stage is better because you, you can't really, you can't really do that with a meme. You can't just put it up on a stage on the screen. So we still get to say it out of our mouth and it's connected to our face, which is connected to our career. So fuck them. You can, you can put your little drawing of Michael Jordan crying with the, with the funny word below it. Uh Oh, uh, I lost you there. Could you repeat that? It broke up. Um, what do you think is the most misunderstood thing about you personally or your artistry both? Oh, wow. That's a good question as well there, Fatty. I don't know. I, uh, I don't know what people think of me really, so I can't speak for them, but I think sometimes people think I'm being mean in my act when I'm just trying to be funny. I'm just trying to get a laugh. I'm trying to turn a, a word into a joke and twist the turn of phrase or anything. So it's all mechanical. Mechanics I'm doing everything's mechanical, but they act like hey, that's that's mean spirit I'm like no, no, I just took that word and it happens to be a dicey subject But I was just trying to make a joke out of this and that like so That I guess that could be something people think I might be being a douche or being a dick But uh, I'm not I'm just literally Trying to to use a pun you said trans I said trans Atlantic like that's a flight that keeps uh, changing in midair, you know, or something. They're like, "Oh my God, how could you say that?" I'm like, "Well, I'm not. I don't care about trans. I don't give a shit about them. I'm just saying, it, you, I got the word trans in there, so I'm gonna make a joke." Well, it's you, all mechanical. You and uh, Joe List do that a ton on Tuesdays with Stories. It feel like it's just like a stream of consciousness at times. Yes, like yes, exactly. Up, you just say a response to it, and I love that because there's so little of that these days in my mind. Yeah, thanks. And but people can spin anything. You know, you go, hey, I heard you blacked out last week. And you're like, whoa, African American doubt. And somebody's like, oh, you don't care about Black Lives Matter? I'm like, no, I just, you're like, I wait, took the word black. <laughs> yeah. I made African American out of it. I thought that'd be funny. And then they just go off on their own bullshit. It's like Bill Burr says everything is cut with your childhood and your thoughts. And then it goes into your brain. And I got to deal with how you feel about it. That's a lot of stuff to deal with, man. Oh, yeah, we're all fucked up. <laughs> Coffee or tea? Ah, geez, that's, uh, that's an insult. What am I? A Mark Licker? Limey? I like coffee all day long. I, I just started drinking coffee when I was 33. I held out my whole life. Nice. And I said, fuck it, I'll try it. And now I do it every day. Yeah, I... I, I never touch tea. Yeah, I try if I'm... If I'm if the insomnia is really kicking in, I'll try to hide having chamomile tea so nobody thinks I'm extra feminine. Right, right. I, I love iced tea. But yeah, the chamomile, I feel like I'm not getting anything. I'm like, 
I got a hot cup of water with a dirty bag of grass in it. This feels <laughs> wrong. Uh, what would be the perfect expression of your career? You know, Mark Norman at, at 100 with a robot body. <laughs> uh, well, you're, you're already halfway there. I'm pretty um, robotic. Well, wait, what do you mean? What would like be my... You, what would be the part, like, if you had, like, a super objective for your, for your career, like, if you could look back on it and say, man, these are the things I wanted to do, or is, is it, like, uh, maybe you, you feel like your, your best comedy special is ahead of you? Do you feel like, you know, you're going for the perfect joke? Ah, uh, yeah. For me, it's uh, jokes, number one, as many jokes as I can get in. And rapid fire, uh, just punchline, punchline. So even if I'm on a podcast or uh, telling a bit on Conan or a special, it's, I just want is a million jokes. I'm a big fan of Groucho Marx. Oh, and no. he was just this joke guy. I mean, he was like a savant of jokes. Like they're really clever and they're almost philosophical. And uh, he has this, I just watched him on YouTube today. He used to have a game show and he would fuck with the, uh, the audience. And there was this hot lady on, and she was like, oh, yeah, you know, I have 10, 10 kids. It's, it's hard just trying to keep your feet under you. And he's like, well, if your feet are under you, it's harder to have a kid or something like that. And I was like, oh, I love that. You know, basically saying, like, you got to be laying down to get laid or whatever the hell. But, I mean, this is in the 50s. About, like, brain, like, some people just have a brain that is firing on all cylinders at all times. Yes, yes, exactly. That. Exactly. Like you watch Conor McGregor and you're like, how did he think to do that in like a split millisecond and dodge that punch and then uppercut and do this and that. And it's the same with comedians sometimes. Like how did he think to twist that that quickly and that smoothly? You know, it, it's, it's word combat almost. Well, also when he roasts people, it's really funny too. Like not just when he's, uh, he's fighting, but sometimes he'll roast people and you'd be like, holy shit. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. That's true. That's I, I, I hand that over to the Irish. They're they're just like a ball busty people and blue collar. They're called the N words of Europe. So, oh yeah, gonna be funny. Uh, Al Albanians Albanians get that one too. Oh, there you go. Yeah, we you know. Hey, you got John Belushi. He's Albanian. Oh, he was. <laughs> <laughs> that's true i guess you got jim we are in essence but he he wrote he wrote it till the wheels fall off literally man oh yeah oh yeah he was an animal um thank you for doing this i really appreciate it i could definitely be asking a lot more but i don't want to take up too much more of your time um check out uh mark norman's comedy special out to lunch on yeah. youtube it's free. It's better than the vast majority of comedy specials that are out there, and it's for free. So don't waste your time and go check it out. Uh, check out Tuesdays with Stories, uh, where Mark and Joe List uh, kind of co-host this really funny, ridiculous uh, podcast. It's actually funny in a comedy podcast, so check it out. <laughs> thanks, uh, thanks. What a concept. And then I'll also put the link to the story of uh, uh, Enos, your nanny, because I don't want to oh. cover it so well on Joe Rogan's podcast that it's like, listen, if you guys don't know about it, listen to it and maybe shout out all over social media because Mark should definitely have this be, be a show. I think it's like a kind of a world changing thing. Oh, geez. Thanks. Wow. Come on, man. This is getting gushy. Listen, you know, I'm secretly just trying to have sex with you. That's really what it is. Hey, I'll take it. If this is what it's like to get hit on, this is pretty good. I don't know what the women are bitching about. Uh, thanks again, man. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah. That's yeah, thank you. This is fun. You're a, you're a bright, bright guy. And uh, I, I'm sorry if I, I could talk about comedy for 10 hours. So I hope I didn't get no, too not uh, at all, man. technical. I would, I, would, I would totally be, I'm all about it, man. Like when I think about it, like you hanging out with some of the, the great comics and the hilarious story of you getting to know Seinfeld and then sending him that text, like Jones. And <laughs> I was yes. I screamed out loud because I've done awkward shit like that in my life. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh have you really? Oh, that makes me feel better. Why? Yeah. Yeah. You know? Um, yeah. Uh, so it's thanks hilarious. again, man. And I, when I'm, when I'm back in Brooklyn, uh, I'll hit you up and uh, I'll get you a bottle of something. You just let me know. Woo! 
what you All like right. as a thank you. Hey. So I really appreciate that. No pressure, no pressure. But uh, yeah, thanks, thanks for having me. Thanks for the shout outs and the plugs. And uh, I'll see you in hell. Praise Allah. Oh, salam alaikum. Hey, there we go. <laughs> Peace. Comedy. Thanks. Bye.